Welcome, Jay. So we are in... That's it? Just welcome, Jay? <laughs> One little quick phrase? You can do better than that. Where are I we? already gave you coffee. Okay. Well, welcome, Fuck. Jay. Enjoy your coffee. Let's sit down. We're going to have a great afternoon together. We're going to unpack some great material. And this is the first time I've ever been here to actually discuss this kind of material. I've only ever been here whenever we have parties and things like that. So Not the parties, fellowships. Fellowship. Okay. Well, I call them parties. You call them fellowship. So we are here for a reason, aren't we? Uh, yeah, yes. So um, we had a privilege to have you at Speakers Call on Sunday. Which is three days ago. Yes, and today is Wednesday. And as we had, a, as we had you, also you bring us one of the kind of very good material which is put together by Dan Brubaker. Dr. Dan Brubaker, this is the first time anything of this care, of, of what we're going to talk about, the, what we call corrections, has been published. Intentional corrections. Well, we are going to come to that conclusion, yeah. but it is corrections. Go ahead and do the title. Yeah, so the um, book is written by Dr. Dan Brubaker, Corrections in Early Quranic Manuscripts, 20 examples, but there are 22 examples inside. So you've got two bonus. And it's not that he can't count. I asked him to add two more. And so he went at my instruction. He went and added two more. And you'll see why when we get to them. Yeah. So um, book is available on Amazon. Please do buy it. Please read it. Make use of it and use it in the engaging with Muslims so that they can see unreliable of the Quran which will allow them to hopefully give up Islam and come to Lord Jesus Christ. In, in fact, what's fascinating, Hatun, uh, it was only made available on Amazon two oh. hours before we got up. We got up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it went live. And we had to be careful because of that. We could not really t say anything. We could not really zero in on any variants or any corrections unless there's something that was published yep. there that we're going. So we want to thank Daniel for doing this. Dr. Daniel Brubaker, this is his doctoral thesis. Not, I'm sorry, this is Some part of his doctoral thesis that he started in 2010, finished in 2014. We're now in 2019. And he has decided this is what, well, in some ways, this is what he calls a, uh, an aperitif. Uh, this is, you know what the French word means? Which is like uh, a taster. Yeah. A taster. Yeah. This is a taster of what is going to come because we only are looking at 22. How many has he now found since 2014? So um, I understood that he has over 4,000 variations. 4,000. Yeah. 4,000 corrections, intentional Two corrections. corrections. Yeah. In every case, these are human corrections. Yeah. Keep reminding me of that because that's the important thing we're looking at. So um, we try to bring up the material at Speaker's Corner, but um, atmosphere at Speaker's Corner is different. So you do have hecklers, you do have people who want to debate with you on the material while you are presenting. So what um, I ask you to come here, uh, we can just go through the material quickly. Yeah. For those of you who wants to listen in a bit quiet manner and also understand well. This so thanks we for making copy. time. Yeah. A studio copy home is what copy. you... That's going to be home copy. Okay, in this way, <laughs> home copy. But you, in, in the, the whole context of that is so that we don't have a lot of interruptions, so we don't have a lot of noise. And also so that you can take each one of these, but please, please, please go buy the book because we're not going to say what the book says. The book is much more in depth. The book goes through, as you can see, it goes through an awful lot more material. You need to go and look at the background. Dan has done a great thing. It's made for lay people. It's made for you. And that's why you need to get the book. Go up on Amazon.com. Go and get it right now. Did you know this? Right now, it's number two on the bestsellers list in Amazon for all the Islamic books. Well done. Which one is the first one, Jay? Nabil Quraysh's Seeking Allah, Finding, finding Jesus, Jesus, which has remained up there for years now. Yeah. And it will remain. But isn't it fascinating? We both knew Nabil Quraysh. I work with Dr. Dan Brubaker. We, they're good friends of ours. So yeah. the two books that our friends are up are right number one and two. And it is amazing that it's in Islamic section and it is written by Christians. Sadly, Muslim scholars doesn't offer and us that much. we brought this up on Sunday, didn't we? Yeah. How many times did we, the Muslims that were there, and we're not going to name them, it's not important, but the Muslims that came and engaged with us, every time they, when they gave a question, we said, well, why haven't you answered this question? Why haven't you done this homework? This is your Quran. These are your texts. Why haven't you done a textual to, uh, textual criticism of the Quran. I think the amazing thing is when we look at the Bible, we see there is a critical edition of the New Testament. Okay, So, so you Bible can here. just go and even buy it from the shop. I do have one in my study room. Versus I cannot go to shop 
and buy the critical edition of the Quran. Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. There Even is the... no historical critical analysis of the Quran. Has not been done by any Muslim of note that I'm aware of. There may be some that I'm not aware of, but the ones who are doing it are those who are the Orientalists. Yeah. People like the the, the Geir Quinns, Quinn. oh, yeah. and von Bothmer, and others who are doing it. Michael Marx, who's doing it in Germany. There are others who are who are interested in the Quran. Uh, François de Roche out of France. So they are actually looking at the manuscript analysis. But as far as redacted criticism, that's when you take and you appoint something, you push something back to another time period. That's called redacting it yeah. back. Source criticism when you look. At uh, the Bible, they made all kinds of claims that much of the stories in the Bible came from other sources. Uh, that was invented on the Bible. That kind of criticism of the Quran, we are now doing it. St. Clair Tisdale started that back in the 1900s, early 1900s, about 100 years ago. 1910, I think, is when he published. So it has been around. What we haven't done, what has not been around, what no one has dared to do, is to look at the Quran itself, look at the text, look variations. at the manuscripts, yep. and ask the million dollar question, which must be asked of every piece of literature that is historical, like the yep. Bible, the Upanishads, the Vedas, the, and the Bhagavad Gita, the Granth Sahib for the Sikhs, and then also the Bible for the Christians. But this book here, where? Are the original texts, or where is the critical edition of the Quran? And define what you mean, critical edition of the Quran. They uh, don't know what you're saying. So there. when I buy the Quran, I I would love to see, for example, um, in Surah seven verse eighty six just came up. I love to see under it there are footnotes which tells us this word has been edited or taken away or not there in the certain manuscripts. Okay, so now you brought up two things that we need to unpack yesterday. Um, on Sunday, I'm sorry, we did ask this. Uh, the, the 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 fellow that was on the ladder next to us, who put his ladder from back, Dawatim, yeah. He was uh, very clear uh, that, and we had to really push him on this. We say, he said he was very clear that the textual uh, tradition of the Quran can be traced right back to Muhammad himself. And then he corrected himself and he says to the time of Uthman 652, because he knew he not dare he did dare not say Muhammad because that that's just untrue. Mm. So, um, can but, but let's take that one step further. He then, when we asked him, okay, the textual tradition, that means you can find a manuscript that can be traced all the way back to the time of Uthman. He could not answer that, number one. So we said, okay, then can you find a manuscript or that's at all from the 7th century? He could not answer that. What did he finally say? Um, it goes to the oral, oral uh, tradition and textual. No, and we were saying, we're not, we're not talking about oral because you can't prove or disprove oral. Oral is nothing more than hearsay. We wanted a textual tradition. That's yeah. what he had claimed—a textual tradition that goes all the way back to the yeah, time da of Islam. Yeah, Dawatim expressed that are, they've got the ninety-eight percent of the Quran. Ninety-seven percent of the Quran. Of the Quran. By what date? Uh, within first century of Hijra, which is 721. from seven twenty-one, which is from seven six twenty-two to seven twenty-one. So up so, to seven twenty-one, they only have ninety-seven percent of the Quran. And then we didn't ask him, we should have gone one step further. Is there any one manuscript that has 97%? Or is it many different manuscripts that when you look them all together, you can come up with 97%? So before we move to that, for um, those of um, people who are going to watch, uh, those who doesn't know that much about the um, completion of the Quran, um, can we just summarize how it came to be according to the Islamic tradition? as well as what is the Muslim claim, Muslims claim that today this book is actually important for um, because it makes it will affect the eternity of Muslims and it will this affect the claims. Yeah, but this book is helping to... Oh, for us. Yeah, yeah. Because this will actually destroy what their claims is. Yes. I see what it's you're already doing. been destroyed. You're, you're being a devil's advocate on this one. That's good. Well, let's do... Like, and let's go back to Al-Buhari, volume 6. Hadith number 509 and 510. That's really the only place Muslims can go to to find out how this book was created. And we know that has been put together approximately 240 years after the death of Muhammad, as well as we don't have the complete manuscripts yeah. on pretty, pretty late. It's, it has been officialized around 1300 Hijra. Well, the earliest manuscript we can find is what we know as the Sana'a manuscript, which is the one that was discovered in 1975. That's for the Quran. I was talking about for the Bukhari. Bukhari, actually, we don't have any of his until the 11th century. And that's only one volume. We don't get all of the nine volumes until the 16th century. 
Yeah, he was, he was writing in the 9th century. Yeah, 1313 Hijra. Yeah, uh, he was writing in uh, 870, so Muhammad died in 632. So you're talking about 240 years after Muhammad. He then writes this reference to uh, this story about how the Quran was put together. And what he says is this. When Muhammad died, the Quran, there was no Quran written down as a codex. Codex. Okay, so when Muhammad died, there is no Quran put, written down at his that time. That's 632. 632, which uh, I have to scratch my head on that. If that was the only reason why God chose him to bring the greatest revelation, why are you smiting? The greatest revelation in the history of mankind. To me, this is pretty sad, and this is pretty odd that Muslims have never been answered this. Why would he, why would, first of all, this is the one thing he was supposed to do, is to get this written down. Why in the world did he not get it written down during his lifetime? Well, he was very busy doing other things instead no, no, of no, learning no, no. after he He is the greatest of all prophets, the seal of all prophets, according to all Muslims. And for heaven's sakes, do what God has appointed you to do. And re remember, he had a secretary. Yep. So Islamic tradition tells us, at, actually, according to Sunni tradition, at the time of Muhammad, we do not have the complete Quran. Nothing. Even when he died, there is no complete Quran. Except what? What did we have? What so did we, they have? So they, they put things, they wrote things on the animal skins. Skins, uh, bones, on bones, leaves, bark, yeah. and also in the memory, memory of the and people. What, the reason why it necessitated to quickly write it down was at the Battle of Yamama, which was in 634. Many of those who had memorized it died. Yeah, uh, according to tradition, 70 people died in that battle. Therefore, Muslims suddenly start being shaking that they are losing the Quran. Therefore, let's put it down. That is identified as the first Buddha in Islamic tradition. The first recension. Now, who was, who was given that responsibility? His name was Zaid ibn Thabit, yep. the secretary of Muhammad, the guy who should have been writing this down all the way along. He was given 22 years to write it down. Why didn't he write it down while Muhammad was still there? Huge question. Nonetheless, he writes it down, and then he takes that copy, and he gives it to the wife of Muhammad named Hafsa. Yeah. Where does she put it? Um, so Hafsa is also the daughter of Umar. Hafsa puts that under her bed. And leaves it there. Yeah. What's around. the purpose of putting the only Quran in existence under your bed? There is something going on with the beds. You know, like there was a Quranic, man, Quranic writings under the uh, Aisha's bed, pillow of which sheep came and then eat it so there is some that i think that's it where you put the yeah. yeah that's the place where you put the treasure probably well can you see immediately if if there is no quran there that they can look at that anybody because it's sitting under the bed of hafsa for 20 years for 20 years it sat there what then would you expect to happen to the quran well someone needed to do something so they started making all kinds there were many different qurans were there not by the time uthman comes to power he comes to power in 646 in 652 remember muhammad died in 632 so you're talking that 20 years later there they realize there are many qurans so as they go to battle um they notice that muslims are calling one another as the kafir non-believers because the way they recite the quran therefore um, muslims approach the Uthman and then say, let's put together one perfect Quran so that we don't want to see the division which um, yeah. Jews and Christians are having. Therefore, Uthman orders one perfect Quran to be compiled. Who, 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 first is he, who does he call again? Zaid bin Tabit, who, who already put together the Hafsa's Quran. And what did he say to Zaid? Go get that Quran that's under Hafsa's bed. Bring it here. 20 years later, it had not been looked at. No one's done anything with it. It's been sitting under the bed for 20 years. No wonder there's so many different Qurans. He brings it up, right? And then what does he tell him to do? Now, this is really interesting. For those of you who speak Arabic, you'll see why this is interesting. He says to him, if you have any disagreement, you mean plural, well, that's because yeah. there's four of them. There's Zaidi bin Thabit, Zubair, Alas, and Hisham. There are three friends of Zaidi bin Thabit. All of them are literate. They all can read and write. They were all, I guess, secretaries. But he says, if you have any disagreement, write it in the Qureshi dialect. By definition, what is a dialect in a written text? So how they, do you decide, how do you know a dialect in a written text? That, that's not my expertise, but my understanding is you need the vowels. And you, you need, need the, the diacritical skills, marks. Yeah. You need to have the dots. Yeah. Uh, if you have one little smiley face, if it's one dot, it's a na. Two dots, it's a ta. Three dots above, it's a tha. One dot below, it's a ba. Two dots, it's a ya. Na, ta, tha, ba, ya. You can have five different letters, depending on what dot you put in. Now, if that is the case, how? if that is the case, that would make sense to get it in the right dialect. The problem here is the problem. There were no dots. 
At the time he's doing this, in 652, dots had not yet been invented. Uh, dots were invented, of course, in other things, but not in Arabic. Those were only introduced in the 8th century, another 60 to 100 years later. Vowelization you talked about. How many vowels are there? Three. Three. The Dhamma, the U sound. It's not the my kasra, area the e sound, expertise. Yeah. The Fatah, the A sound. That's it, three vowels. Now, there's long and short of each one, so maybe six. But certainly, these vowels were only introduced in the late to early 9th century. So how could he be asking them to make sure that they write it in the Qureshi? There is no dialectical differences in the 7th century. Sake of the argument, let's say, yes, that is correct, because we know Bukhari is looking back and then thinking in the 7th century. And this is a redacted critical analysis. From a redacted criticism, that is impossible. Yeah. So... Um, Bukhari is looking back and then putting that story for us. But also it's helpful to remember... Now, why? Allah because in the late 9th century, then there is diacritical mark. Yeah. In the late 9th century, then there is valorization. He's basically saying, this is what I would do if I was in the 7th century. Get the right dialect. Without thinking, there was no dialectic differences in a nothing more than a razm. Razm means a consonantal text. Ooh, I love that. We're going to be talking a lot about that today. So, just uh, wanted to make a point on... Um, at the time of Muhammad, Muhammad received the Quran in seven different ways. Okay? Wait a minute, hold it. How just, can you receive just, it in 70 different ways? That's the called miracle of Islam. No, no, that's no, no, another no. topic. I'm asking you from an Arabic te text <laughs> point, you just now contradicted what we've just been talking about. I know. So, readings. Seven different ways. Readings. Okay? And then Uthman steps in, and then Uthman says, get rid of that seven different ways. Now we are going to put, we are going to make it only in one way. That's the dialect of Croatia. I'm asking you again, Hatun, how can you have seven different readings? A reading requires diacritical marks. A reading requires vowelization. Are you seeing why I'm asking this question? You can't uh, have, uh, this I is called known as I can't and do much about it if it is the miracle of Islam. Because when we look at the Islamic tradition, we see people are reciting Surah 25. One of the guy wants to grab other guy. Because of the way he recites, because it is very different than what they learned from Muhammad. Exactly. Muhammad steps in and then says, it's all right. This has been revealed to me in seven different ways. How can you get revealed unless it's written down? Uh, you can't re reveal a different dialectical reading in a, in a written text if all you have is a razm. I call it miracle of Islam. <laughs> so... Um, now, can you see, I am, I, I, we are kind of going back and forth, but for those of you who are listening, can you see, for especially the Arab speakers, this is a real difficulty. Case in point, if you were to go right down here and you were to go to the shop and you would go to the high street and you want to get an Arabic Quran, now you'd have to go uh, to an Arab store and okay, you want to... don't have down, that in here. <laughs> uh, you don't have it here, but when in London there are, yeah. there are especially uh, um, around... What, uh, in Marlebon area, there, is, area there, is, there are lots yeah. of stores where they're selling newspapers. When you go and get a newspaper that's been published in Egypt, when you open it up, you will see it's only in razm. It'll have some diacritical marks, but it has no vowelization. Why have they left the vowels out? Because the way they recite it is different. The, the way, way they you read, it, read it in Morocco is different, different, different than, than the way you read it in Egypt is different than the way you read it in Jordan. Therefore, in order for them to sell it to as many Arabs as possible in many countries, they keep out all the dialectical differences. Yeah. That's a dialect. In order to even make it universal, you've got to keep off the vowelizations. At this point, how can you have how can you have even more than one vowelization unless you have the 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 uh, the dama, the kasra, and the fatah? That didn't even exist. So can you see this is Buhari speaking in the ninth century again? This is he's redacting it back in a period when this could not have happened. So in somehow that happens, okay? So and then. Um, Uthman orders first Quran, second perfect Quran to be put together, and then he orders everything else to be burned. Hold on a minute. Wait, 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 wait. What do you mean burned? Wait, wait, wait. Ev you're not saying the manuscript itself were burned. Everything was written down beside that one uh, Zaid bin Tabit put together, uh, everything to get rid of that, and then he makes nine copy and then sends so these what nine copies. What does that tell you if they were burned? Uh, there are lots of disagreements within it, so it, no one wants to have access to You only burn something that disagrees, is what you're saying. Yeah, okay. and he was accused of, like, oh, don't follow him because he's the bur he burned the word of God. That's a different topic, anyway. So we do have, from that, we supposed to have our first perfect, complete Quran. Yeah. That's 650s. Which that is fascinating because... 
then why didn't they just use Hafsa's copy and just keep it as it was? Why uh, didn't they just copy it word for word, letter for letter? No, there were no diacritical lines, so you can't do it there. Why didn't they just do that? Why didn't they give hers back? So obviously... Or they could just use that one instead of like taking lots of time for them to put it down, new one, and then get rid of everything. But something happened that there were the disagreements. Uthman thinks it is his right to make that decision and get rid of what is disagreeing with the Quran they put together. So one final copy was made six fifty and six fifty two and then nine different. other copies were made and they were sent to where? Sent to nine different cities with someone who knew the Quran well who, Which who were well, you, you tell us. I, okay, I, well, let's count. It, it used to be Listen. four when I met I, you. <laughs> as, listen, as long I've been for 37 years, I was always told it was Basra, Baghdad, Damascus. I'm sorry, Basra, Baghdad, Baghdad Damascus, Damascus, and Medina, and, uh, and Medina. That was it. Those are the four I was always told. And I grew up believing that. I was taught that. I think many of you Muslims who are hearing me, that's all you've been taught for. But that's not how many provinces. There were nine provinces yep. at the time of Uthman. So let's do it. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Jerusalem. Uh, I said Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Nishapur. Aden, Herat, and Nishapur. Yep. Now, how, many, how many fingers do I have? So nine. You've got ten, but you are holding nine. So nine, 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 nine different uh, Qurans has been sent to the nine different nine cities. Nine different cities. Of those nine cities, how many with are still someone, Islamic control? With someone who memorized it well. So, so besides a, Jerusalem, a scholar. Oh, a scholar went with yeah. this one. Yeah, besides Jerusalem, um, all the cities are still under the Islamic Empire, under the Muslims. In 1,400 years, have any of those cities gone through any type of attack or any type of fire or any type of flooding? Any way that the manuscripts could have been destroyed? I think Tayyar Artuklaj would answer that question better than me because he says, we don't know why, uh, like there is no fire, there is no earthquake, there is nothing happened, yet we do not have the Quranic We don't have, have one. one. Not one Out of, of those nine. nine exists today. Alta Kulic and uh, Ekmen and Nasalunu are actually two of the foremost scholars today in the Muslim world. The only ones who have looked at all six of the major manuscripts. They had spent five years doing that, and they all they came to their conclusion there is not one Uthmanic recension, which yeah. you can see is a real problem because there's no Uthmanic recension. Either there's ineptitude, which I would suggest there is, or they were never, there were not nine to begin with. So, but no. we're looking for nine. Okay, so now we don't have any Muhammad's Quran, any Abu Bakr's Quran, any Uthman's Quran from Surah 1 to Surah 114. We don't have all 114 surahs in any Quran. And we, and we brought that up in, uh, on the ladder, didn't we? Yeah. We asked, can you... Ca what, and basically, and this is what I want to say. I want to find three things. Because every Muslim claims it is eternal. And the Quran says that in chapter 85, verse 22 right here. It's very. It's it is eternal. It is the eternal. It's on the eternal it's on tablets. Tablet. If it's the only eternal tablets, that means it had, it is, it it has no it has no creation. It has never been created. It exists eternally alongside Allah. That's the Quran. Main when we look at the Islamic tradition, Islamic tradition tells us if someone makes a claim that Quran has been cre created, they are not Muslim. They are kafir. So according to Sunni tradition. Quran is eternal speech of Allah, eternal word of Allah. The Mutazilites made this claim in the ninth century. What happened to them? They were all killed. Religion of peace. <laughs> yeah, religion of peace, not so much. And then the Ijtihad, which is the uh, interpretation of Scripture, was shut down for a thousand years until Muhammad Abdu reintroduced it in 1905 at oh. Al-Azhar University. So you have made some videos on this topic. Those of you who are watching, you can just go and check those videos. Let's move forward and come to Dan Baker's material. Well, let's just finish this up. I see we have four minutes. Let's just wrap it up real quickly because we're not going to get into his material until the next video. What yeah, I would like to say is this. In the last four minutes, can you see there's some problems we have here? Immediately, first and foremost. We don't have the problems. Muslims have the problem. I we are have just, some problems with We this. are going to verbalize those problems okay. for Muslims. Muslims, here I have it. First and foremost, can you see the Arabic that we're talking about could not even accommodate God's language, God's holy book. If this is such a great book, if this is the last of the revelation, if this is the final revelation, if this is the best revelation, why would the, God in his wisdom choose a language that could not even accommodate his revelation? The fact is very clear that in the 7th century, when you say it was revealed to Muhammad, there was no Dhamma Qasr al fatta there was no diacritical marks, all there was was a Razm. The Razm was a consonantal tech, which we're going to get into later. Can you see a problem immediately? Secondly, why would he choose a man who could not read and write to give his revelation to? 
And hold, hold on a minute. So he couldn't read or write, but he didn't know Arabic, right? When I started learning Arabic, I didn't know Arabic, but I learned to read and write in two weeks. It's not that hard to read and write. There are only 28 letters. Well, are, you, are you trying to tell us Muhammad, who is supposed to be the mercy to mankind, couldn't learn how to read and write within 22 years? He had 22 years to learn to read and write. Why didn't he learn it? Secondly, and thirdly, he had a secretary. His secretary could read. That's what secretaries do, right? They read and write. Yep. If they're not, then they're not worth their, 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 what, what they're paid. Obviously, he had 22 years to write this down. What else was he writing if he wasn't writing down? The most important thing that Muhammad was supposed to be revealed to, certainly the most important thing that Muhammad was given as his mission. Now, when he dies, Abu Bakr finally decides to do what Muhammad didn't do, and he gets Zaid ibn Tabi to then write it down. Why in the world did he not make copies at that time and send them out to every province? He should have done that. Should have. What did he do? He gives it to the daughter of Umar. She puts it under her bed. She used to be a wife of Muhammad. And she leaves it there for 20 years. To me, I don't know what's going on here. But if you have one responsibility for the Quran, you should make copies and send it to every, every nation and every city. And then, read, and then guard it for heaven's sakes. But in 20 years, they couldn't even guard it. Obviously, there were many derivations. So the Uthman comes around and he then goes... And hold on a minute. Why does he just cop why does he copy that one? Why didn't he just take nine copies from that one? Let, just let me just express something. Within twenty years of um, twenty years after death of Muhammad, so far what we saw is oral tradition has failed. Oral tradition is not that trustworthy because there are different Qurans are out there. There are lots of misunderstandings regarding the recitation of the Quran out there. So the whole thing of Ahruf and Kiryat is absolutely innocuous. But even so, let's just take on board that these were different readings. We pretty much well know this is not different reading because you don't have any diacritical marks, nor do you have Ahruf, I'm sorry, nor do you have the vowelization to even delineate a, or a dialectic difference in a written text. Now, if that is the case then, and I want to ask Muslims to please answer me on this, then why in the world did, Maha, did Uthman have to then destroy and burn all the remaining manuscripts? And if he then took this one manuscript, made nine copies, sent it to nine cities, where are they? I would like just one. I would like just one of the nine. We can't even find one. So one Quran from Surah 1 to Surah 114 with the 6,236 verses from the time of Uthman, or from 650s. And unchanged. We'll leave it there.